In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now at the hour of our death. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, that instruct the hearts of your faithful by light of the Holy Spirit, granted by the same Spirit, may be truly wise and rejoice in his consolation to the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Lady Guadalupe, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint John Bosco, pray for us. Saint Curie of Ars, pray for us. Saint Padre Pio, pray for us. In the name of the Father and the Son. Good morning. This is the week in which we prepare you for uh, the general confession. So I'm going to be talking about the sacrament confession uh, this morning, and then have a have a funeral a little bit later on, shortly after this talk. So um, let's talk a little bit about confession uh, biblically, uh, catechetically, and practically. Okay. Some people say, you know, where is confession in the Bible? Okay. Uh, especially non-Catholics and there are a lot of responses that we can give, but the institution of the sacrament is John 20, 21 to 23. John 20, 21 to 23. And that's, uh, it's Easter Sunday night in which uh, the apostles are, due to fear, they're enclosed in the upper room that's called the cenacle. Jesus has already appeared several times and already at night he's going to appear another time and he, in his glorified body, glorified body was able to go through, go through a wall like a ghost. He, he goes and he appears to them and he says, Shalom, which means peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them, he breathed on them the Holy Spirit. And he said, whose sins you forgive, they will be forgiven. Whose sins you hold bound, they will be held bound. That is the traditional Catholic uh, apologetic, so to speak, response to the institution of the sacrament of uh, sacrament confession. Okay, because the Lord breathed on the apostles who are going to be the first priests and bishops. He said, who sins you forgive, they'll be forgiven. Who sins you bind, they'll be held bound. So it's good to remember that, John 20, 21 to 23. Okay, now, uh, the specific effect of the sacrament. Uh, there are seven sacraments in the Catholic Church. Okay? Uh, you, got, you divide into three categories, the sacraments of initiation, baptism, communion, confirmation. And you have the sacraments of service, which would be that of uh, holy matrimony and holy orders, and the sacraments of healing, which are the sacraments of the anointing of the sick and confession. That's the division of the sacraments, their, um, their purpose. Now, the specific effect of the Eucharist is nourishment. Okay? We're nourished by the bread of life. Okay, the specific sacramental effect of confession is healing. It's healing. Because sin wounds our soul. Sin wounds our soul. One of the best biblical verses that, that fleshes this out is one we had a couple of days ago in the Mass. And it's the, the passage where the man is carried on a stretcher, the paralytic is carried on the stretcher, and he's lowered down to the roof, and Jesus says, Your sins are forgiven. And then you have the Pharisees that are criticizing Jesus in their mind. He says, what's easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to tell you, tell this man to take up his mat and to walk? So it's to prove that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins, he says to the man, take up your mat and walk. And he did. So there you have a double healing. Jesus heals the, the holistic approach, so to speak. He, he heals the whole person. But what's interesting is Jesus first heals the man's soul and then his body. 
That's very interesting. Because we, we are, as, as philosophy teaches us, we are a composite being. Composite means we, we, are a, we have a body and a soul. Our body is very important. Okay? But our soul, our soul is more important than our body. Our body is going to die one day. So Jesus first, he heals the he first heals the soul of the individual, then he heals the body. Okay, there are analogies we can give for this healing. Jesus heals the leper. You make a good confession, you're healed of your spiritual leprosy. Jesus heals cancer. Okay, sin is cancer of the soul. Jesus heals the paralytic. Sin is moral paralysis. Jesus heals the blind. Sin blinds us to Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. Okay, Jesus heals the deaf mute. What does sin do? Sin, sin deafens us, it blinds us, and it binds us. Those are the three verbs that I like to use with the effect of sin. It deafens us. We can't hear. It blinds us. For example, the sin of lust. Thomas Aquinas says, blinds us from spiritual realities. And it binds us because Jesus says that sin is slavery. Sin is slavery. Look at an alcoholic. Look at a drug addict. Look at a porn addict. They're, they're, they're slaves. They're slaves. They're actually slaves. So Jesus comes to uh, break these bonds. All right, um, so there, there's some biblical background to this, uh, to this sacrament. The Catechism of the Catholic Church uh, gives various names for the same sacrament. Uh, gives various names. And not that the, uh, the, the, the sacrament is, is changed by the different names, but it gives a different perspective of what the sacrament, the purpose of the sacrament. Okay, one is confession. It means we have to confess our sins vocally to the priest who represents Christ. Then it's also called the sacrament of penance. So by going to confession, you have to carry out the penance that the priest gives to you. It's also called the sacrament of uh, forgiveness. Uh, when, you're, when you're absolved, you're forgiven of your sins. It's also called the sacrament of reconciliation. Reconciliation, what does that word mean? Reconciliation means that if I have damaged a relationship with someone, then I have to try to reconcile with that person. I have to try to uh, make up. Okay, and finally, it's also called the sacrament of God's mercy. It's the sacrament of God's mercy. Through confession, we are, we are, we are absorbed in God's uh, infinite mercy, which is, according to St. Faustina, St. Thomas Aquinas, and many saints, uh, the greatest attribute or virtue in God is his infinite mercy. His mercy. All right. Um, so that being the background, wh the why? Okay. Okay. What is? Okay. What is a general confession? Why should we do it? And I'll give you the brass tacks uh, as to how to make it. Okay. Uh, wh the why of a general confession. Uh, I'll give you various reasons. Number one is St. Ignatius says we should do it. Actually, for me, that's, that, that's good enough. Okay? St. Ignatius, he's the one that gave us the exercise, not Father Broom. Okay? And I try, to, I, try to follow, I, I try to follow what the saints teach, not what the political leaders say, but I, I really believe in following the saints. No? And, and that, of course, is the narrow path, the narrow path of the cross. Okay, second reason is that you make a genuine confession, you really grow in humility, which is a very important virtue. 
It demands humility. Also another is that through confession you grow in self-knowledge. And as Socrates says that uh, a life that is not examined is a life that's not worth living. And as the historian says, he who does not know history is condemned to repeat the same errors. I think that was Toynbee, some uh, historical scholar. He who does not know uh, history is condemned to repeat the same errors. No? Um, even something as simple, if I'm pitching and I throw a fastball on the outside corner and you hit a home run, I'm going to throw you a curveball next time. Yep. I will. Because you're good at hitting the, the fastball but on the outside corner. So that the knowledge of your forte in hitting is going to get me to throw you a curveball or maybe a sinker. Okay? Or maybe change of pace. And you're, you're expecting 195, it'll come 88, and you're, you're, you're off pace. Okay? You're saying baseball length, you're lunging at it. Okay? So it helps us to grow in self-knowledge. Self-knowledge. Okay, but this one I'm going to say now is maybe the most important. Okay, there are, there are certain sins that are very embarrassing. Okay? Very embarrassing. Maybe when you were 15 years old you had a, a, a lesbian experience for, you know, maybe a week. Who knows? Maybe a cousin dropped in and, <coughs> you know, she had that problem and you gave into it. Uh, maybe you committed adultery. Maybe you fell into the sin of masturbation. I mean, face it, it's embarrassing. <laughs> it's embarrassing. Or maybe you stole something and you know, you, you know, you were a thief when you were in your early 20s, no? Who wants to flaunt the fact that he's a thief? None of us, no? Uh, so all of these, uh, these sin, sins are, sins are, are embarrassing. Uh, they cause us a lot of embarrassment and shame. And that could happen, it could happen such that they're so embarrass embarrassing that you're, you're paralyzed. The, the fear paralyzes you from confessing the sin. And you hold it back. <laughs> you made a bad confession, okay? And if you make a bad confession, then you make bad communions. You make bad communions, I mean, you're in a bad state of affairs, okay? You're living, you're living a double life. You're maybe professing your faith with your lips, but you're holding on to sins that have not been confessed. And the root cause is pride. The root, root cause is pride. You know? um, any priest that's been a priest for 10 years, he's probably going to tell you, no, no matter what you, whatever you say, we've already heard it many times. You know? And I've been a priest for more than 30 years, so you, you're not going to surprise us. You know? You know, you're not going to surprise us. Maybe a priest is just ordained for a week. <gasps> well, what did you say? No, <laughs> no but I mean, uh, I remember when I was studying to be a priest, uh, there was a book by Del Covalo that said, even if your, your, be your best friend were to kill your mother, you shouldn't be surprised. That was one of the most graphic images I remember, no? You know, your best friend killed your mother. <laughs> probably should be surprised, but you shouldn't be as a confessor because uh, as Teresa of Avila says, those who are living in sin, uh, we shouldn't be surprised what they do, we should be surprised what they don't do. And whether, in other words, the horrendous things that people do, it could be much worse if the grace of God did not spare us. No? We're, 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 we're capable of the most heinous, ugly things without God's grace, without God's grace. But with God's grace, we're, we're capable of the, of the most incredible works of, of nobility. Read the life of St. Lucy we celebrate today. It's incredible. <laughs> Little girl, I mean, she, she was tortured. They poured burning oil upon her. They gouged her eyes out. Uh, that's why she's a patient of eyesight, no? You know, when she, uh, shortly after she died, her eyes returned. She's a little, little teenage girl. Where did she get that? <laughs> Where did Maria Goretti get that strength? It came from God. God's grace gives us the, the ability to do, to do so much way beyond the human capacity. So uh, 
just starting now, if you, if you don't confess well, if because of shame or fear, for the love of God, when you confess, try to confess well. Okay? Try to be as clear and transparent and humble as you can. Don't be hazy or fuzzy or try to, you know, color it with these kind of florid adjectives. Call a spade a spade. Say it as it is. Let's take this one more step. Okay, people get married. Get married in the church. What are they thinking about a week before marriage? Or 10 days, or 10 days before their marriage? The, the social part, right? The party and the guests and uh, the, the woman, the wedding, the, the wedding dress. Uh, how long is it going to be? You know, uh, painting your fingernails and all those transcendental things that are of primordial importance, right? Are you going to throw rice or is it going to be bubble stuff, the new things, okay? Is it going to be chocolate fudge cake or is it going to be carrot cake? All those things, oh, so important, right? I guess they're going to be coming in from the Philippines or from Vietnam or whatever it might be. And because of that, maybe, be, maybe before you got married, uh, you had fallen into the sin of fornication, and more than once. So because of all these social uh, arrangements that you're responsible for, you never make it the confessional. <laughs> You never make the confessional. So in your marriage, uh, if, you're, if you're in the United States, if, you, if you've ever lived in Brazil or Argentina and Chile, at least in the past, we would sometimes have seven or eight marriages back to back. Sometimes ten. Ten marriages on Saturday. And each marriage would be, would be 15 to 20 minutes without the Mass because you've got so many people there. In the United States, um, uh, we usually have, in our parish, three to four, three to four weddings. Father Larry has said no longer four, but just three. You know? and, and often, for many years, I would have, you know, three weddings back to back to back with a mass. With a mass. So what happens if you, if you don't make a good sacramental confession before your, uh, your, your wedding day? It's a double whammy. <laughs> in other words, when you receive... Okay, you have a double sacrilege on the day of your wedding. <laughs> Terrible. Terrible. And I think that's really common. And I think that's one of the reasons why most uh, marriages end up in divorce. Because, you, you're, because te uh, theologically, if that happens, you have your first child and the second child and the third child and you're... you're, 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 you're it's been eight years, and you've never really gotten, gotten along well together. It's always been a stormy marriage, to say the least. Then after eight, nine years with three kids, the bomb explodes, and you're separated. There's a good chance that you never receive the sacramental grace of marriage. You never received it. Because if you, you, know, you receive it in the state of, state of mortal sin, you don't, you don't receive the grace. And I think that this is, this is really common. Th there should be a book written on this. There really should be. There should be. And it might be your case. I don't know. I mean, you have your own conscience, no? But you, you'll be before God. You have your own conscience. We're all going to be judged, right? Therefore, in this parish, uh, all the programs that, that I've set up, uh, I'm known as the tough priest, okay? okay? All the programs I've set up are the most, the most demanding, across the board. Mother comes in with her little kid. I'm, I'm going to bring my kid to First Communion. Okay, lady, you're with me for two years, once a week. Hey. 
that after two or three months, uh, she, well, you know, I didn't know anything now, Father. Thank you. I can say my prayers. I know the rosary. I went to confession after five years. No, I know how to read the Bible. I know most of the mysteries of the rosary. Well, you know, that's why we got these formation classes for adults. <coughs> but those who get married in the church, uh, I give them spiritual mentors who give them talks once a week for six months to a year. So they could have as many as 50 talks with the spiritual mentors. And I insist that these spiritual mentors have to give this couple an examination constantly. They have to make a good confession before they get married. Otherwise, I don't want to marry them. I don't want to marry them. You, know, you don't have to come to me. <laughs> I'm not the big man on campus. No, any, any priest you want, go. Okay? I don't want anyone to receive that sacrament without being properly disposed. And in this, I'm demanding. I let a lot of things fly, but when it comes to contact with Christ and the sacraments, I'm a lion. And it's, a matter, it's a matter of salvation. This is the principle and foundation, Right? Principle and foundation is getting to heaven. So being kind of flippant and nonchalant and um, uh, on, the, on the reception of the sacraments, it's not good. It's not good. So if you are married, and this is, uh, this is your, your reality, uh, thank God that you're here now, and uh, reconcile to God. If before you did get married, you really made a good, con a good confession, well, praise the Lord. Humbly thank God. Maybe you had a really good priest that was preparing you and said, look, you've got to go to confession. Here's a booklet here. Write it out. You know, we were, a couple of priests will be available a week before. Go in there and make it well. And maybe that was your case. I hope so. But it probably wasn't <laughs> because of the uh, real uh, dearth and catechesis over the past 60 years. Okay. Is that clear? Okay, so that has to be said. Uh, otherwise, we're, um, we're in trouble. Okay, now that, I, uh, now that I've kind of scared you, okay, I want to say something very consoling, and then I'll go through the steps. Uh, it's very interesting because um, I, um, I, try to I, I try to listen to Catholic radio a little bit every day. And today I'm actually on Catholic radio. I have my own program, okay? Wow. So, uh, in Spanish, okay? <laughs> for, many, for several years now, okay? But uh, what the, what, what the conversation, if you're driving your car, between Father Eric Nielsen and Chuck Neff that they're talking about in, um, in the inner life, which they have from 9 to 10, is uh, I was thinking about bringing this into this talk today, and then they started to talk about it, and I said, well, I think God is confirming. And what I'm going to say right now is going to, some of you are probably fearful now, and maybe that fear is good. You know, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? Is this. All of you, if you want, can receive a plenary indulgence. Okay, the topic that they're talking about right now, at nine, from 9 to 10, they're talking about purgatory. Purgatory and confession. You can receive a plenary indulgence. But if you don't know the conditions, you're not going to receive it. So uh, many people are probably going to spend a lot of time in purgatory because <laughs> they didn't learn their catechism. Because of ignorance. Okay, the last thing that they're talking about, Father Eric Nielsen was talking about the um, story of a nun in a convent uh, who, uh, there, was, there was, I guess a, a sister was able to see when, pe when people die where they went. And one of the nuns in the convent, who, who wasn't really that good, seemed to be kind of like an average nun, not that good. Well, it wasn't at St. Margaret Mary Alacoque or St. Faustine or Teresa of Avila. She died, and she went right to heaven. 
and the, the nun that was the, the seer said, well, why did she go right to heaven? She wasn't that good. And Jesus said, because she, she took advantage of all the... <laughs> okay, you got it. Okay, good. And the reason being is that she, she took advantage of all the graces and the indulgences that the church gives us. And I myself, I'm no great saint, but I, I, I want to go right to heaven. And I'm going to take advantage. <coughs> I'm going to take advantage of all that the church has to offer. Okay, I, haven't, I don't have this memorized yet. Um, and I could easily just Google it in, but I'd like to have my little black book. Okay. Um, you know, we as priests, uh, we, we carry out many obligations. One is we visit the sick. We visit the dying. Okay. What do I have here? The apostle is... Okay, no, it, it's called the apostolic pardon. Oh, there you go. <laughs> okay, apostolic pardon. Okay, it's, it's about 100 words, less. You know what that is? Okay, you're sick and you're dying. I'm able to give you this apostolic pardon. This will give you a plenary indulgence. You like that? Apostolic. Okay, let's go through it now. Okay, you, you can receive a plenary indulgence. Now, even if you've, you've lived really bad lives up to, up to this point, we're going to be preparing you for the, we hope, the best confession in your life. So probably ne no better time to talk about this topic than now. You can receive... Okay, irrespective of your past. And I'm not downplaying sin. We've been meditating upon that the past three weeks. Okay. But you can receive God's pardon. Not only his pardon, but you can be you, you, you can you can be freed from all temporal punishment. Because when you when you go to confession, you receive forgiveness, but then also there's temporal punishment that has to be remitted. That might not be done with what you, do, what you do, what the priest tells you. But if you carry out what the church tells us, you can receive the plenary indulgence. Plenary indulgence is kind of like this. Imagine a huge recipient of, in, in, um, in the back of the room that has diamonds. Each diamond is worth a million dollars. And there's, there's countless diamonds there. And I say, after this class, Everyone can grab on as many diamonds as you want, free of charge. Would you do it? Yes. You would run there, you'd dive into it, and you'd be just grabbing on to all those, free of charge. Well, that's what indulgences are. They're, they're, free, they're free for your picking, but you've got to pick them. <laughs> you've got to know that they're there. <laughs> Otherwise, you die, you may end up in purgatory for a thousand years. And as Nielsen was pointing out, Aquinas says it's, it's the same fire as hell. But you know you're going to get out. You know, the same fire as hell. Fire hurts. But you have the hope, you know you're not, you're not damned, you're saved. Okay. You go to confession. But you've got, you got to try to make a good confession. You've got to beg for the grace. Try to make a confession... It's not a, maybe a routine, perfunctory kind of confession, but a confession really deep. Hopefully the best confession in your life. And this is right on the, uh, it's right on the uh, threshold of, of, of Christmas. You know, Christmas is right around the corner. So confession is being born again. Yes, are you a born again Christian? I am. Every time I go to confession, I'm born again, okay? Born again Christians. So really prepare yourself well. Okay, then you have to carry out. Now the priest may not give this. The, the priest probably won't give this as your penance. But he might. There are certain indulgence acts. Okay, one is you pray. You, you pray the rosary, either. In front of the Blessed Sacrament, praying in front of the Blessed Sacrament, 
they're special graces. For example, I, uh, I have an advantage over you lay people because I live in a community with priests, but in my house, we have the Blessed Sacrament. What do I do almost every morning in my holy hour? About an hour and a half, I expose the Blessed Sacrament, and I'm with the Lord. I love it. I love it. Sometimes, you know, sometimes I just say, Lord, I don't, I don't have too much to say, but I just like to be with you. Lord, I like to be with you. And I know you're present there. You're my best friend. Lord, it's just good to be here. Bless me. Help me through my struggles. It's a, it's a great holy hour. I'm, a, I'm almost like a little child. No? You, you might understand when you go deeper in prayer, your prayer becomes much more simple and much more from the heart. I've given you a very complicated method <laughs> because most of us are beginners. But as your prayer grows, it becomes more simple and more affective. More simple, less ideas, more effective becomes more and more from the heart. And that's Teresa of Avila, okay? Teresa of Avila, she's the doctor of prayer. Okay? In, Saint, in, the li- in the life of St. Francis, he's there he's spending the night with a friend, and he gets up in the middle of the night, and the whole night he just says two words, the, one phrase, my Lord and my God, the whole night. That's, that's the only thing he says, my Lord and my God. That was the seven hours, that was a seven hours prayer. My Lord and my God. In other words, of Thomas the Apostle, right? Now, uh, uh, being, being brought up and raised and having kind of like Scottish, Irish, German blood that I have, uh, tend to be kind of legalistic. You know, if, you, if, you, if you've done this, then you have to pay this, okay? And uh, for many years, Many years I, I, I was that way. You know, you've done that, you've got to really pay for it. Okay? Now I'm more and more falling in love with the Divine Mercy devotion. Even though we might be the most heinous sinners, one act of pure love is enough to, is, is enough to burn it all away. An act of perfect love. You know, like the good thief on the cross, right? Remember him? He was a pretty bad guy, wasn't he? He was a thief, he was a murderer, he's an insurrectionist, he wasn't any goody two shoes. I mean, I think the Hawaiian Garden Cholos would be afraid of this guy. I mean, he was a tough guy. And the Cholos of East LA, I think, would be afraid of him. He was a tough guy, but he, he turned to God and Jesus forgave all of his sins. So you pray the rosary in front of the Blessed Sack. Oh, you can't do that? Okay, pray, pray it with your family. Okay, okay, pray it with your daughter. That's enough. That's family, right? You don't have to have all your grandchildren. Just you know, pray it with your daughter. Okay? It doesn't have to be long, elaborate rosary where you're saying uh, litanies and this, these prayers. Uh, pray it uh, New York pace, okay? Our rhythm is quicker, okay? <laughs> Why not? Father Larry's from the South. It takes him 20 minutes. It takes me 13 minutes, okay? <laughs> New Yorkers, you ever been downtown New York? They work... They work quick. They move. move. Couldn't be. That. It's not irreverent. It's just that you have maybe the pace is a little bit quicker. But reverential. Okay. If, if you like. Now listen. Meditating upon the Bible half an hour. You're doing it an hour a day if you're if you're obeying the rules. <laughs> half hour a meditation of the Bible. That's enough. You're doubling that. Or if you like, have you ever made the way of the cross? The stations of the cross. Can you make the stations of the cross? So those are three, three or four different indulgence acts to receive the plenary indulgence. Okay, two other things. One is very simple and easy, but you have to do it. And it would be, you have to pray for the intentions of the Pope. You have to pray for the intention of the Pope. Because we're a family, the word Pope in Spanish and Italian is Papa, Papa. He's our spiritual father. Pray for him. Okay, now here's the most, here's the most difficult, but it's possible. Are you listening? Yes, Father. 
is you have to renounce all sin in your life. You have to renounce all sin. More than venial. You do that. You, okay, you make your confession. You do that. Then you go to Mass. And you receive Holy Communion. And you pray the rosary after Mass or before Mass. You get a plenary indulgence. And your soul is as white as the snow. If you die, you go right to heaven. You hear me? So if you, if you want to go to heaven, you can. I've told you. Now, if you don't go to heaven, it's not my fault. I told you. And I explained it very clearly, right? Yes, brother. Very clear. You heard it. And I, more and more, and my, I'm preaching this to my 13-year-old confirmation kids. Are they going to remember it? Probably not. Probably not. Maybe half of them will pick it. I mean, I, I, I'm... I'm I'm very clear in my preaching, very blunt. Uh, teenagers, you know, something their head, their, their mind is out and up in the clouds at times, no? I tell it to their parents. So, uh, be aware of this. About 15 years ago, uh, my, my, my mother was barking at me saying, you son, you got to preach the plenary indulgence. Nobody knows about it. You're right, Mom. Yeah, I'm doing it now. And more and more, I'm going to be trying. And it's not ritualism. You're just carrying out the acts, but you don't have the intention. You don't have the intention to try to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And give up. Another word for that: give up sin. So every time you say no to sin, you're saying yes to the love of God. In our parish here, it lends itself to a perpetual reception of plenary indulgence. Our provincial was saying the Mass at 8 o'clock. Guess where I was? I was in the confessional <laughs> up until about 9 o'clock. What do we do after Mass? We pray the rosary. Where? In front of the Blessed Sacrament. How do we end the rosary? We pray for the Pope. You got it. This parish lends itself to a, a constant flow of grace where you can receive the plenary indulgence. Now, if you don't receive it, we're not at fault. We're not at fault. I mean, we give you five Masses a day, usually two priests here in confessions at 8 and 12 and 6, 6.15 or 5.30. Saturday, we're there. I'm there for four to five hours. No? What more do you want? We try to make it as easy for you as possible. But I have to, I have to, I have to accentuate this. The essence of this, the essence of receiving the plenary indulgence is that I really want to love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's the essence of it. You hear me? Yes, Father. The essence is love. So you say no to sin, you say yes to the love of God. That's what it is. But you see that you're tempted to commit a sin. No, I'm not going to do it because I love God. And he loves me. How do you know it? Look at the cross. How can, anyone, how can anyone look at the cross with at least a little bit of openness and his heart is not moved? I have difficulty to look at the cross because it's painful. If I look at the cross, it always does me good. But it makes me suffer. I know Jesus suffered for me. He loves me so much. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. Lord, I'm going to try to be more faithful. That's why we, we don't, we're, not the, we're not Protestants, are we? Mm. We don't have just the cross there without the body. We've got the body of Christ on the cross. And more, the, more graphic, the better. More graphic, the better. And any graphic crucifix is not going to be the reality. Mel Gibson was probably the best. The way he depicted you know, the suffering of Christ on, on Good Friday. So I, I came at you with something tough about the whole idea of possibly... Now, living a double life, but I've given you something of great hope. Even though maybe, you, maybe you've been living a double life the past 40 years of your life, you make a good general confession, and you carry out those, uh, w the indulgence acts, you're as good as the snow. 
I went to confession two days ago. <laughs> Guess what I did? Went to Mass. I prayed my rosary, prayed for the Pope. I'm offering this for me. I want this plenary indulgence. I try to get one every, at least once a week. And I really believe, I really believe there's a good chance when I die, I can go right to heaven. I believe it. Not because I'm a, a, a little flower or a St. Alphonsus or John Bosco, but I really believe in, I, I really believe in what the church is offering, and I'm going to grab onto it. I'll often say when I'm reading St. Uh, Saint Faustina, if these, if these priests or bishops don't want the great, give it to me. Give it, give it, give it, give it, give it. I'll take it. <laughs> The other day I was, I was reading, listening to uh, St. Catherine Labore, the Miraculous Medal. Some of you have a Miraculous Medal. You have one on there. What are those, what are those rays that are coming out? Those are the graces, grace that many people don't even ask for those graces. Yeah, many people don't ask for the graces that they don't receive it. We should be asking for those graces that no one asks for. Now what are those graces? Mary didn't specify, but if... I said something. Mary, I don't know what those graces are, but give them to me, though. I'll take them. <laughs> You're the full of grace. How sad is it? God, God is giving us so much, and we're just touching the tip of the iceberg. The tip of the iceberg. How much do we know of our faith? Very little. And we have to admit that. Even though, you know, I, I've got four degrees. I mean, I have a little bit of studies, right? But I recognize there's so much I don't know. But I have a hunger for the truth, much more than you people. Every spare moment, trying to learn and learn and learn. The more I can learn, the more I can give to others, too. But a real hunger for the truth. Hopefully you do. I'm not a young whippersnapper. I'm in my 60s already, but a real hunger to get to know God more. Hopefully that's your case too. Is it? I believe it. So my friend, there's a, let's, pray for each, let's pray for each other that all of us will go right to heaven. Amen? Amen. You like that? Yes. You like it? Why don't I pray that? Isn't that a beautiful prayer? Beautiful. So when I offer my Mass today, I'll pray for you that we go right to heaven. You pray for me. Go right away. But it's not, it's not a mere ritual. The essence, what? The essence is love. All those conditions I mentioned, all those conditions are related to one thing. Lord, I don't want to sin because you love me so much and I want to love you in return. Amen? Amen. Okay, so hopefully after I sledgehammered you at the very beginning, um, <laughs> Use that expression, though. No? Uh, hopefully, that'll give you a lot of encouragement. Do you have any of you have any any of you have any children? Tell your children about that. Who oh, no, knows? Maybe that will bring them back to the sacraments for Christmas. You can explain. You know, this is what Father Broom told us in the class. Plenary indulgence. Okay, you made made a lot of mistakes. So have I. Make your confession for Christmas, and as Jesus is born, you're going to be born on Christmas night. Why not? Why not? You have some university friends and tell them about that. Okay? You have the teenagers, tell them about that. So we're lost because of weakness of our heart, because of, but also ignorance. A lot of ignorance. <coughs> a lot of ignorance. Right, David? Okay, let's, let's go through the five steps now, okay? This is... Um, this morning I, left, I listened for about 10 minutes to uh, Patrick Madrid, and a good part of the first hour, second hour I think it was, he was talking about the importance of, um, of good catechism. And he strongly, he strongly recommended uh, the catechism when we are brought up and raised. Remember the Baltimore Catechism. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Your daughter was probably too young, but you know, we were born in the 50s or earlier. Remember, we were brought up and raised with the Baltimore Catechism. Remember that? Mm -hmm. yes. And there's, the, there's, there's three different versions. No? He really promoted that we go back 
Uh, it's not perfect, but it's a really good catechism, and that expla explains very clearly the five steps. And they got great pictures, no? Great pictures. Okay, the first step. Examination of conscience. Second step would be contrition or sorrow for sin. The third step third step would be firm purpose of amendment. Firm purpose of amendment. Fourth step. Confess your sins to the priest. Can't say, well, I, I confess directly to God. No. Verizon Wireless. I get this wireless connection. Yeah, you can't do it that way, okay? Okay, the fifth step is you got to carry out the penance. Carry out the penance that the priest gave to you. Okay, let's spend just a, a couple minutes on each of these steps. And, um, you know, I strongly encourage you to obey John Paul II. John Paul II, in his document, Catechesis Tredende, which was his... Um, his writing on, on catechesis says, we have to go back to memorizing the basics. How true it is, bad things that have happened to us, bad memories, we never forget them. Bad memories, they can stick with us. The wounds of the past, we should pray for the grace to memorize the basics of our Catholic faith. And one would be these five steps. And even if you haven't, you haven't learned it yet, all of us should, have, should memorize the act of contrition. The act of contrition. Okay, now, uh, what are we going to do? First step, examination of conscience. So we're going to be giving you this little booklet. Okay. Okay, Father Altier. Okay. Over the past couple of years, I actually wrote another one, which I think is much better, but it hasn't been approved yet by the uh, by the local authorities. And I don't want to. I, I, I here said I can't spread it yet until it has the imprimatur. No? Pray that it is. Because mine is, is much better because it's more modern, okay? Uh, but I still, still have, to, have to work through that, okay? I've got that in Spanish and English once. That is approved. I think you're going to sell like hotcakes. This is pretty good, though. It's a Father Altier, okay? Okay, now, to, uh, what is also key in our process of memorization all of you have to know what is a mortal sin. And it very rarely have you ever met a Catholic who can tell me the three conditions of mortal sin. I learned that in second grade in New York with the Dominican sisters, and I never forgot it since. I said, thanks, thanks be to God for memory. Now, you know, if, because if you don't, know that, you don't know this, I think you're always living in... You're always living unsure, uncertain, you know, this immortal sin, can I receive communion? You're always living in a state of doubt, in a state of insecurity, and I think that's hell on earth. I like to live with a lot of security. I do. Is this immortal sin? Is it not? And what are the conditions? You know, try to, okay, try to memorize this. It's just basically three words, you know? Okay, the first is this, for a mortal sin. It's um, 
It has to be grave matter. Grave matter. The second is is full knowledge. The third is full consent of the will. Okay, those are the three conditions that constitute what is called a mortal sin. Mortal sin. Now, mortal sin kills the grace of God in our soul. The two worst things in the world are mortal sin, but something worse would be to die in mortal sin. It's called the second death in the, the book of the Apocalypse. Okay, if you like analogies, okay. Venial sin, you got sniffle, you got a cough. Mortal sin, you're filled with cancer. Big difference, right? Okay, venial sin, you you fall off your bike. Mortal sin, a head-on collision in the 605. Both going 60 miles per other into a Mack truck. Big difference, huh? Venial, you, 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 you steal, a, you take a Milky Way bar. Mortal, you steal a Maserati from the parking lot. Big difference, huh? Know what a Maserati is, any of you know? It's an Italian sports car worth about a half, a half a million bucks. It's pretty expensive. Any of you come in with a Maserati? Probably not. <laughs> Okay, you came in with a bicycle, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so grave matter, it means it's something serious. Something serious. Full knowledge is that you know it. Full consent of the will is not an accident. You do it anyway. That's a mortal sin. Okay, I want to tell a story heard on relevant radio. My father... Monsignor Stuart Swetland to amplify this a little bit more. Okay, there was a Texan lady that went uh, on vacation to the Florida Keys, and she's walking on the on the beach, and she was taking some of the clams and the mussels that was on the beach and putting them into a a bucket. And she filled the bucket with these clams, these shells, and all of a sudden, she saw someone behind her, and it was the the Floridian policeman that put her handcuffs on her and put her into the car and said, you're you're, you're going to be thrown into jail for a couple of days, and you have a $700 fine. She said, why? Because you took those shells without permission. She said, well, in, in Texas, we're able to do it. You're not in Texas, you're in Florida. Now, the idea idea he's making is this. There are many Catholics that they, they, they don't know the truth. In other words, they've been negligent in studying their Catholic faith. In moral theology, that's called culpable ignorance. Culpable means you're, you're guilty of that. Culpable ignorance. You know, you might, you, might, you might even, when you're making your confession, you might even think about that story. And some, you got, some of you have children. Maybe you didn't educate your children the way they really should have been educated. Maybe you were remiss. Now that you can say, well, I didn't know that. Well, you should have known it. Okay, uh, uh, hopefully this will never happen. My brother is working there in Orlando, Florida, and he's an orthopedic surgeon, okay? He's a back surgeon. He makes a mistake, and he says, well, I didn't know that I, I didn't know that I, uh, that I, I should not have cut there. Hey, 
you're the surgeon. You're not a butcher, you're a surgeon, right? There's a big difference, right? So what's going to happen? You've got lawyers, lawyers knocking on the door to try to sue him because of negligence as a doctor. How many sins do we commit because, uh, because of negligence? You know, we, offer, we offer to the adults these incredible programs for their formation. A lot of them, a lot of them will not come. Now, on the Day of Judgment, may God have mercy on them and their kids fall on devices. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen on their, their Day of Judgment. They, they just flaunt the incredible opportunities to know their faith and transmit to their kids, but they rejected it. Look at, look at the way their kids are living now. They're living like animals, okay? Addicted to all these different vices, no? Probably the sin that we least confess, but we should confess more, is the sin of omission. You know what that means? Omission means not doing what we should be doing. For example, your parent, have you always taken your children to confession at least once a month? I don't know. I, <laughs> if I had teenagers, I'd take them to confession once a week. You got teenagers? Are you kidding? They've never had so many temptations as today. Hey, kids come in and come from, when was your last confession? Well, when, uh, the day before I made my first, conf- first confession. When was that? Five years ago. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's laziness. That's omission. You're being remiss. You're being negligent. Your obligation to get those kids into heaven. Not to kick them into hell. (laughs) So part of this course is trying to form our conscience better. To aim at a a well-formed conscience. So those are the three conditions. Grave matter, full knowledge, but I'm saying there could be culpable ignorance. Well, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to know that because if I know that, then I'm going to have to change. No, that's called bad will. That's called bad will. If I know that, hmm, I'm, I'm not going to talk with that priest because uh, he's going to tell me I can't use contraception. I think I'll go to another. He's going to pat me on the back. <laughs> bad will. That's bad will. That's dishonesty. You don't want to confront the truth. You're a coward. Yeah. It's cowardice, no? Yes, Not living up to the truth. You know, you, you people, if you, if you love Christ, he's the greatest of lovers, but our Lord is very demanding. He's the greatest of lovers, but he's demanding. You know, Mary has a daughter who's a Carmelite, you know, the contemplative comedy, you probably know this, they enter into their cell and there's, there's a cross on the wall. But the corpus is not on it because they're supposed to be the one that's nailed to the cross. So the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, you know, the three vows that we have. But you know, there's a real freedom and there's a lot of peace and a lot of joy when we follow the Lord. Because you know, beyond Calvary, there's the joy of the resurrection, right? Amen? Amen. So, full knowledge and full consent of the will. It's not, an, not like slipping on a banana peel. No, no, it's not done by an accident. You do it. Okay, let me give you an example. Is, is Mass on Sunday, is that important? Yes. Or is that something somewhat significant. It's a matter of life and death, right? Okay, so it's something serious. Do you know that? Yes. Then purposely you miss Mass on Sunday. That's a mortal sin. That's the clearest one I can give. Now you're sick? Okay, no. You got to look over your, your child who's got a flu and you got to be there. No. 
But if it's done because of sheer laziness, that's a, that's a clear-cut mortal sin. Clear-cut mortal sin. I missed Mass once in my life because in New York there was a snowstorm. You know, there, those blizzards? And the snow can, with the, with the snow drifts, they can go up, you know, six, seven, eight, right? You, you. Yeah. So one, on one occasion, we were, we were basically snowed into the house there. In West Nyack, we couldn't get out. I don't think that that was a mortal sin. That's right. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, trying to form your conscience even better. Okay, say, for example, you're married and you've got three children. They're 9, 12, and 15. Now, you don't go to Mass on Sunday. They don't go. Is that sin more serious? Yes. What's the word called? Compounded. It's, the, it's compounded. Exacerbated. It's made more serious. So you've not only committed the sin of missing Mass, but you've compounded it by giving bad example to your children. So you're breaking the third commandment, but you're also breaking the fifth commandment. Thou shalt not kill. Why? It was a scandal. Do you know what scandal is? What's scandal? Scandal is giving bad example to others. So it's actually, I mean, obviously you've never said that before, but you know you have a theologian speaking to you. I'll give you some of the other ramifications. It's scandal. Scandal, scandal is against the fifth commandment. So I, I, I hope and pray, I hope and pray that you really make the be- best confession in your life. But also, for the love of God, try to try to get the plenary indulgence. Do you have it memorized? Not complicated, okay? Your confession. Go to Mass and Communion. One of the actions could be your rosary in front of the Blessed Sacrament in your family, okay? Or, or your holy hour, you're meditating. A half hour, you're doing an hour. Pray for the Pope, and then you have to what? You have to give up sin. So by saying no to sin, you're saying yes to the love of God. You say no to sin, you're saying yes to the love of God. Take advantage of it. It's like I'm saying, there in the back of the church, there's a recipient of countless diamonds. Each is worth a million dollars. You can take as many as you want. Would you like? Take and grab as many as you like. They are free for the gathering. Yeah. These treasures, indulgences, they all, they all come from the Paschal Mystery. Paschal Mystery means Jesus Christ, who suffered and died on the cross, from his heart came forth blood and water. That blood and water is applied to us in these indulgences. And the blood, the, the blood of Christ washes us clean. And as the prophet Isaiah says, even though your sins be as red as scarlet, I'll make them as white as the snow. Amen. So I hope and pray Mary's going to be finishing up the talk. She's going to be giving you also the opportunity to make your general confession tomorrow and Saturday. Okay? So let's say, Hail Mary, that we're all, we'll all be well disposed to receive the incredible gift of God's mercy this weekend. So we can be born with the child Jesus this Christmas. Amen? Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, and, and bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners now at the hour. Glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Saint Ignatius, pray for us.